recording. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us on a Thursday. Um, but it's unfortunate that we can't have John today due to technical difficulties, but I hope he can still catch up. He's trying to connect. If not, then he will join us tomorrow. The good thing is we are privileged to have in our midst today our guest artist for tomorrow. It's a beautiful surprise. Alex is in our midst. Say hi, Alex. Hello, hello. Good to see everyone. <laughs> He's with us. So he can, well, he can actually help us go through the day, go through his colors. Um, of course, we are also joined by our brand ambassadors and artists like Anna, Elisa, Mark. Um, and I think Angela will join us later. Uh, so we will proceed as usual, our Thursdays, as always about playing with colors. And today we're going to explore Alex's colors. Um, we will paste the colors in the chat in Zoom and also in Facebook. And I think we can start now. We'll switch to, we'll just spotlight first Geo's um, camera so that we get to see Alex's colors. These are Alex colors. Okay, it's on spotlight now. Yeah. So on screen, we have Alex. Can you help us wave again, Alex? You're on spotlight now. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Hello, hello. Where are you at uh, today, Alex? I'm in I'm in Paris. I live in Paris, uh, so I'm in my studio today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, just past eleven o'clock at night. Wow. Uh, but uh, but I've had my coffee, so uh, I'll I'll stay awake. Thank you. So it's good to so, see everyone. Thank you for being here. So this are Alex's colors and I'm going to paste the colors again for those who are joining from Facebook you can quickly check um, Alex's profile and colors from our timeline and for our friends in zoom we're just about to paste in the chat um, Alex's colors these are his colors and so the favorite part or activity of the day is to begin swatching. Are you ready, Gio, Anna, and Elisa? <laughs> so first, um, we can have ultramarine blue. Now we'll just follow the order based on Alexis dot card. Yeah, it's ultramarine blue. And of course, we, as usual, would encourage everyone to swatch along. If you have uh, some of Alex's colors, feel free to explore mixes. And if you have questions, you can either for friends in Zoom, you can, of course, um, unmute the mic and yeah, speak directly to Alex or to, to any of our BAs here doing the swatch. And if you're not comfortable speaking, you can also just type in your questions in the chat. And we have Anna who can also help us look into questions sent through Facebook. Thank you in advance, Anna. Who else is watching? Let me see. I can see Anna. <laughs> Bill, are you swatching? Oh, we have Bell and Bill. So Bell today is not swatching. I don't think. Not today. Okay. <laughs> I, my my um, house is uh, an explosion of my studio, so I don't know where anything is right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bell. Next caller, we have um, Pyro Scarlet. So Gio is now swatching his Pyro Scarlet from his half fan. This is one of those reds that I absolutely love. I do a lot of, if you've seen my Facebook or Instagram, you know, I paint a lot of, um, Paris architecture and I, I'm in love with these red awnings from all these cafes 
And so this pyrrole scarlet is really great when the sun hits those. It's just, it just glows. So this is a great color for that. Organic vermilion is another one. Uh, I'll mix those to, just to get, give some variety. Patrice, are you swatching? I am with the colors that I have Yay. that are similar and or the same. Feel free to, if you want to share your swatch later, just let me, let us know okay. and we'll put you on spotlight. Okay. I think our live sessions has been really doing everyone, um, helping us form a community. And it's always good to see how <clears throat> unique our swatch swatches are. Yes. We play with the same colors, but even the swatching, speaks so much of you as an artist, the uniqueness of every artist. I, I guess you could say I already have swatched because I have taken all my colors from Daniel Smith. Mm -hmm. and Oh yeah, look at that. So you've swatched all your Daniel Smith colors, Belle? Yes, alphabetically in a binder. That's neat. We'd love to see this Belle on a better image. So just wondering whether you have this shared in on social media, your Facebook or Instagram account? I, yeah, I can. I, I, can take a picture of it. I don't have any camera where I can mm. do it. And I'm expecting by tomorrow night, I'll have another 12 colors. Wow. So they, do you have, uh, well, they I won't be alphabetical. I'm sorry? Do you have access to a scanner? Sometimes. <laughs> you might be better off doing it like that on a flatbed scanner. Okay. And getting images like that. I mean, you, 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 want the, you, you just want a page or do you want the whole thing? Um, it's 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 only when you're when it's convenient for you, Belle. I, I just thought okay. it's good just to look at uh, to view these swatches, um, a closer look. Only when you're okay. pretty able to do it, but thank you. Yeah, and, sure. and I have I have all the information. Okay. With them, and where's my finger? There it is. I have I'm all the. Yep, yeah. you're very organized. That's a great <laughs> idea. I love it. And I have all my colors on a. Um, mm, I, I I saw that watercolor. What's the header? What what does it say? Oh, it's it's the watercolor. Oh, you printed the the, the information I, from the website, right? Yeah. yeah well, I've, what I've done, I've taken an inventory of all my colors, and I have their their pigment color and their manufacturer and the you know wow. the. That's great. Thanks, so Belle. I have, you're welcome. And I think we I have, have a question, question. From Anna. Go ahead, Anna. Hi. Hi. Um, no, I just wanted to share that I'm like Belle. I'm also um, uh, doing the swatching of only the colors I have. I you mm -hmm. can see that I'm missing organic vermilion, but I have. Uh, so I'll be going along. So I yeah, think I can, uh, share. And hi, Alex. I took your course a couple of years ago, and I love it. And I want to recommend it to all. It's awesome. And, thank, you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very being much. Here. Yeah, very excited. Thank you. It's good to meet you. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you too. <laughs> uh, thanks, Anna. We'll be having a lot of feedback on uh, Facebook. Really appreciating uh, Bell's work and Bell's organization there. But um, saying fantastic, Bell, and whoa, and that's great, etc. Uh, can you talk? Can I say something? Is that Barbara? It's Barbara. Go ahead. Barbara. Yeah. 
Alex, can you talk about cerulean blue versus cerulean blue chromium? I, I love the cerulean blue chromium. Uh, it's, it's such an interesting color and I don't, I don't use it on its own. It doesn't feel like a color that I ever see out in the world, but it mixes oh. incredibly well with, um, where is it? My Indian red. Okay. Uh, those two, Indian red is a really, we'll get to that in a second with the swatches, but oh, maybe it's doing now. Um, that's a really kind of chalky, opaque color. And those mm -hmm. two uh, will kind of neutralize to make a really interesting gray. Um, Oh, yeah. I, I love I love that that kind of the classic combination of cobalt and burnt sienna or or ultramarine and right. burnt sienna to make a gray. This is another way to get to a similar gray, and it just has a different personality. Um, okay. There's something about that cerulean blue chromium that's really kind of electric, uh, but it but it does. I use it as a mixing color. I think on its own, it's just it's kind of too, too much. much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Ian. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, have you tried a uh, Vadata blue? That's a, a mix between um, cobalt blue and um, and cerulean blue. I think I have a tube of that and I haven't really played with it that much. But now that you mentioned that, I think I might have to dig it out and uh, mm -hmm. and give it a whirl. So thank you. Yeah, best of both worlds, isn't it, that one? That yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I bought some of that too. It's kind of complicated for me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't used, I mean, I have lots of swatches, but I haven't used it in a painting. <laughs> Well, they're interesting. I really think of these individual colors as like spices when you're making a really interesting meal. And wow. some of them work well together and some of them you get kind of a funky taste. And so it's really nice to figure out, you know, the combinations that you enjoy and that, that play mm -hmm. well together. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I found that. Well, I see with Giovanni, look at, I just did too. I think there's mine. I think we have a question from Susan. Yeah. I, I could see. Um, yes, hi. Um, hi. This is Susan, and I um, have. I'm noticing how you're using the watercolor stick, and so I have all these watercolor sticks, and I usually just paint from you know pans, or you know the real or, or a palette. But when I've done my watercolor sticks, I draw on the paper, and then I wet the um, color. And so you get a different, when you're doing these samples up here, it's a lot different than taking the paint straight from the stick. Does anyone else mm -hmm. use their watercolor sticks like that, where they draw and then they put the water on the, then they use the water. But Gio, would you like to share your experience? The difference for the, sorry, for the, the stick and the, the pants? Well, no, um, like the color and how you get the watercolor on, like I see the person, they're using the brush and then, you know, touching the stick and then painting. Often I've used my stick and color, maybe because I'm a pastelist also. And then I use my brush mm -hmm. on top of what I've drawn. I, I prefer to take the, the color directly on the stick in this mode because um, um, the, the real use is considered the stick is not a pastel, but it is, um, is better to use um, take the brush because the stick is a pure watercolor, is a few parts of water and a few parts of gum arabic and the, a very, very pure. In my style, for example, I use it for the uh, for the details directly with the brush, every type of brush, especially my my range 20 zero brush or four brush. 
And um, this is my experience. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I guess I've been using them the wrong way. <laughs> in, in reply to your question, we, we don't, that's not, not the wrong way. That's just another, another way that we do use it. With, uh, I have works the way you've talked about with drawing first and laying on the water. And then after that, then I'll lay a wash on top and merge it that way. So there's, uh, Giovanni's been really great in showing just a plethora of ways, a wide variety of ways to, to use the sticks. Okay, thank you. It's so a very multi-level, a very multi-level way of uh, using an art stick. It, it can go on dry, it can, it can go on dry on wet, wet on wet. You can paint with it traditionally. It, it is extremely versatile. I think Gabriel has given, I think it was Gabriel, gave really good examples of using the watercolor stick flat, not only drawing with the, the edge, but actually using it flat also. Like you would with a pastel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big blocks of color. Oh, okay. That's a good idea. Thanks for that question, Susan. Alex, do you have any experience um, with the question about using the watercolor sticks directly onto the paper before water? Uh, only a very little. I, I mainly use paint out of the tube, but but when I've done it with the sticks, I, I just, it seems natural to just draw with them like a, like a crayon or a pastel mm. and then add water on the paper. So, um, so Susan, you're not doing it wrong. <laughs> 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 or, or if you are, you've got company. Um, I, I just think, you know, there's sort of, there's kind of no rules when it, when it comes to how you get pigment onto a page. Well, they're really good for plein air because yeah, if you, you go can. out in plein air, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you don't have to manage the water and everything going on with the wind. Mm. Yeah, you could probably block something in pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and traveling can, in the airport. Yeah, true. <laughs> you can also kind of do some nice dry brush techniques just by scraping that stick across the paper if you're using if you're using paper with a little bit of tooth to it. Um, and then you add water and you, you can just get a lot of texture out of, you know, the way you apply it. Alex. Yes. Uh, outside of your um, color swap that you've got. Um, are there any other colors that you like using at all? Yes, I, I don't know if I see opera pink on this list. That has made its way into my palette. Wow. Um, oh, I like and, that color. Yeah, and um, you know, I've started to use, I think it's either lamp black or ivory black. I think I have an ivory black that, that's found its way into my palette as well. That's, I use that incredibly sparingly, but um, there's a few that are, that are finding their way into, you know, you always kind of, you always want more to play with, right? We, we know that, um, what, did we, what did you just call it? Uh, sorry. Opera pink? Opera pink, yeah, sorry. Uh, we know that that's not particularly light fast. How do you feel about that? Well, I, you know, I have to be careful with that. Um, I use it very sparingly. I use it to, I, I mix, it mixes so well with cobalt blue to make a really beautiful shadow color, kind of a lavender shadow color. Mm. Um, but I, I am aware of that. And so I, you know, I, I do want to find other ways to get uh, similar effects. Um, I think a quinacridone red uh, mm. is close. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm aware of that being a little fugitive. So it's um, it's just something you gotta you gotta pay attention to. I think. In in that particular situation, uh, do you, do you find yourself thinking about uh, taking photos? of 
your paintings and that from a retail viewpoint is it, is it a better strategy to uh, do a painting from a uh, I'm going to do this as a photograph to, uh, to sell on as a copy rather than a, an original that's just sold on once um, yeah, I could do that. I, I, I photograph most of my work. Um, I haven't made prints per se, uh, mm -hmm. but I, you know, that's always an option. Um, I think if I sell pieces where I've used certain colors that may, may not be light fast, I'll tell the, the buyer yeah. and just say, you know, don't put this in sunlight, you know, <laughs> hang it in your house where it's going to be somewhat protected. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm up front about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Do you have- I'm noticing, I don't know if you want the questions now or to wait for tomorrow, but I'm noticing you're a little bit light on the yellows. You don't have very many options, but you have both raw sienna and yellow ochre. Can you explain, they seem very similar. Can you explain the nuance and why did you choose to have that nuance and variety? They are very similar. And, and honestly, I've been reaching for raw sienna a lot more than the yellow ochre. Um, again, with my Paris paintings, uh, you know, I'm sort of looking for a color. The, this, this building color, this stonework of Paris is a very pale, warm uh, color. Um, and, and both those colors will kind of get you there. Uh, it, it really depends on the light. It depends on the time of day. It depends on the season. Um, raw Sienna feels like a pretty tried and true, um, color for me. Um, yellow ochre feels a little, um, a little more saturated, a little bit more on the yellow side of life. Uh, so it can be, um, I don't know, sometimes it feels more Italian than Paris, um, but it's nice to have, I, it, it's, it is a subtle difference, but I find it's nice to kind of have both. Uh, do you have them both there? Oh. I'm looking at them. Uh, Raphael often talks about Monte Amiata natural sienna. And mm. if you're talking about just a warm one, I've, I've just been introduced to Gothite, that was really a gentle, gentle. You're looking for these nuanced stone colors, mm. but this is probably more of the color of Jerusalem in Paris. <laughs> that does look a little sandy. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's so, it's so interesting because these colors can be so subtly different. Um, and they, th you really see the difference when you sit them next to uh, other colors. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, you know, it's, again, it's like, I feel like these are sort of your building blocks, these colors, but it's how you mix them, what you put them next to. Um, I, I, you know, I find that raw sienna and the yellow ochre make a really nice kind of base. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate this tomorrow, um, but I'll, I'll brush that on very lightly. I'll use a lot of water um, and I'll, I'll brush it on pretty quick so you still see a lot of the white of the paper. So there's hardly any pigment there at all. But then later, once that's dry, I'll add some shadows on top of that and I'll add sort of a cool, maybe kind of a lavender um, bluish shadow. And those, that's the combination that really, you start to feel that sunlight. Um, so, you know, it kind of depends on the, on the subject, it depends on kind of the the feeling I want from a certain scene. But I'll 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 use one or both of those colors. Um, but I just kind of which like one? It. Which one do you think is more transparent? I find raw sienna a little bit more transparent than yellow ochre, but it depends maybe on the yellow ochre I use. You know that that might be true. I haven't done in-depth tests with those because again I, I water them down so much that they're really if if they're opaque they're really transparent when I use them um, but you might be right the yellow ochre might might be a little bit more a little less transparent than raw sienna Alex yes 
Uh, do you ever use in that context um, buff titanium? Yeah, you know, I had buff titanium in my palette for a long, long time, and I realized I never reached for it. And I think it's fallen by the wayside, but it's such a great color. It's such a great mixing color. Yeah. Um, you can really make skies kind of milky. It helps with atmospheric perspective. It's one of those colors. I, I think I need to, I think I have one slot left in my palette and it, it might be waiting for buff titanium to make its return. Cause are, yeah. Are, you a, person, are you a person who likes to rotate your palette in, or do you like to stick with what you know? I, I stick with what I know, but every sort of year or two, I'll think, all right, come on, let's let's mix it up and let's let's find it, find out something else that's out there. And I, I find for me it helps with with traveling because for me every city has a different personality, has a different kind of light uh, and a different color palette. And so um, you know, I feel like I've got a pretty good range in my palette, but you know, I go somewhere I've never been before and suddenly I'm missing sort of a key color. Like if I were to go to Jerusalem, I would probably need that Anna Marie, whatever you just showed. Um, you know, you just, you kind of, you're always sort of searching and finding new, new favorites. We've talked pretty extensively on this channel how the light shifts even around the globe and just in the different countries that we're in, that we're in the light shifts, which changes the colors completely, which is why it's nice to have so many colors. Yeah. You, you're experiencing that. You were talking about that uh, just moments before we went live, how the, the experience in California was so different than Paris. And there's a factor of just the angle of the sun is different. The colors are completely different. Yeah. You know, I've thought a lot about this. Um, it, it has a lot to do with your latitude. Obviously it has a lot to do with the season, but it has also to do with just the geography of, you know, where is there an ocean breeze coming in? Are there mountains nearby? What color are the buildings? Are they close together? Are they far apart? Um, London is not that far away from Paris. It's further north, but it has a completely different light to it. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with just the architecture of the city, how close, how narrow the streets are, um, the color of the bricks. Um, but yeah, there's a million elements that go into that. And, and it's, I mean, I, I love that, you know, going to different cities and just being like, all right, what's going on here? This feels different. Um, so yeah, yeah, you kind of, you, you, need, you need all the colors. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I've noticed from your paintings you do quite a few uh, cityscapes. What what kind of artist do you consider yourself to be? Are you an architectural il illustrator or an urban an urban painter or? Do you, well, you know, I've I've sort of done all those. I don't I don't know about categorizing myself. I live in Paris. I love the way the city looks. And so that's the subject that I'm drawn to. Um, I love painting the light of how, how the light and shadow kind of reveal the form and the personality of these buildings. Um, I, you know, draw a lot of inspiration from the Impressionists, how they saw light. Uh, how they tried to sort of capture fleeting moments. Um, I've done, my background is in film illustration, so I certainly know what that world is like, uh, and I know that it can be a little bit more technical. Um, and so with my painting, I like, to, I like to move away from that and be a little bit more loose, a little bit more free. Um, and kind of impressionistic with, with my colors, especially not, not sort of tied to reality so much. Um, so I don't know, but I, I don't know about, um, I'll leave it to other people to sort of uh, <laughs> categorize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, this is Susan again. And, um, and, you know, I'm a real color junkie. And I definitely agree with every place I go, it's a different palette. So the way I travel is I have these Altoid boxes 
with a whole bunch of little pants inside with all these colors. And I was wondering, does anyone else have a better solution to bring all your colors than that? Um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm interested because I do have a little tiny um, plein air palette, but I switch out the colors all the time, depending upon what I'm painting. I think that's a really smart thing to do. I, I do that. I don't have the Altoid box, but I've got like those little metal palettes that hold 12 or 14 colors. Um, I've, I, I put together kind of an Italian palette a few years ago um, that had a lot of granulating colors because there's so much texture and patinas in the walls. Um, your system is a lot better than my Ziploc bag full of tubes because inevitably something is going to open and everything is turquoise. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I love, I love the idea of just having a lot of different tins and then you're, you're kind of free to pick out the one, one thing, according to the city. The one thing about the way I've done this, I started with a dot. So I've got all my colors with me in this book, at least for, you know, a, a short trip because, you know, I'm not going to be using all of them, but you know, if I'm just going to be out for a day or so, this is a. Nice, easy way of carrying all my colors. So you can use that as a palette. You can just yeah. watch. Oh, that's great. That's great. It's on watercolor paper and all the, where it's, you know, where I put it down and then walked it out. It's, I've got dots. I love I it. Can, I can reconstitute it. Nice. That's a good idea. I also or, use or make, make your own dot card of what you like to carry or use all the time. I also like to use the Altoids can canisters, but recently I've been taking my children's paint tubes, paint canisters that they're finished with, clean them out, and put my pigment in, uh, the Daniel Smith pigment inside. And then that'll travel really easily and quickly nice. as well. And then I let it dry. Another alternative to an Altoids container. Yeah. I love it. There are um, uh, micro palettes as well, aren't there? That, that pans that are like a quarter of a size of an half pan mm -hmm. that you could use for, you know, a single day going out. Mm -hmm. I think Anna's showing something there. I, um, I actually, <laughs> one of my cats gets medicine sent in this little plastic container. <laughs> so I save them and they use it as a little, as a little palette. So cute. Yeah, perfect. Small. <laughs> Dollar Tree have things like that, don't they? You know, pound shops and Dollar Trees have little container things you can put. I like to um, use the 15 half pan, the little 15 half pan Daniel Smith. And I've got a couple of them right now and I'm going on a river trip and I can put uh, whatever colors I want for that river trip in there and put it in a little tiny uh, waterproof bag with a brush or two. And that works great with little tiny papers. I mean, you're going down the river and you can sketch, but that's a perfect size to be able to fit anywhere. And so I have different custom palettes that I make a little card on the back of it tape it to it so I can see um, exactly what the palette is that I'm taking on a particular trip. Nice. I can have, you please show us this is what you the, have? Uh, pill, a pill case oh. from uh, We're going on a river trip soon yeah. and I have it packed away already. But it's oh. this, yes. you know, it's this little uh, Daniel Smith. Some of the, uh, ready-made palettes come with this and then they have the empty one. This is a mess um, that you can fill yourself. So I just take whatever, I have enough of them that I can just um, change them out for a particular trip. Mm, thank you. Or a desert trip or something. I think Alex, we were about to show us something. Uh, yeah, I have this little, uh, this is a little moleskin. I think it's a camera case, but um, uh -huh. 
-hmm. but I can just, I've got kind of everything I need in here. I'll always have this with me. Um, it's got tiny little brushes, but it's got, it's just this, you know, the little tin, uh, which has um, however many that is. Um, Twelve. And these, you know, these are those little half pans that you can swap out. Yeah. Um, so that's small enough that I can have in my bag whenever I'm I'm out, uh, and then I've I've got a larger palette that I'll use, um, you know, if I'm if I'm sort of intentionally plain air painting or or here in the studio. Bill or uh, plain air painting. This is a a little pill a pill case for four weeks of pills, so 28 compartments. They're a little bit larger than a half pan. They can be filled up uh, and you have access to 28 colors. You can see that I've written the names of the different colors and they're all on a, on a uh, sheet that I have. You see what I have available for that trip, but it works very nicely on trips. There's lots of options there, isn't there? What we can like either get that are made for that or um, you know, you might find in a dollar tree that's not particularly for art that does the job. So, this oh, is you going to move on to something else? We are pack. Um, yeah, how about your brushes? Do you have any particular favorites that you like to stick to, or do you dabble in many different brushes? Yeah, you got another hour? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. You can see them all behind him. Yeah, yes, I, I was, I was oh, holding these up earlier. He's got a brush crafter lunch. Well, yeah, the, I mean, brushes, you know, I love, I love paints. I love pigments. I love Daniel Smith. Uh, brushes are sort of my weakness. I cannot go into an art store and leave empty handed. Um, even though I have more than I need of every type, there's always something that you know, I fall in love with. Um, I, I do love the Escoda brushes. Um, yes. Uh, the, the Reserva, the Ultimo, um, Aquario. Uh, this is, what is this? This is a Raphael, a flat brush. I just, I kind of have a big variety of things. Um, I do love this dagger brush, again, by Escoda. Uh, and I, I kind of mix it up between natural fiber and synthetics. Um, I think I prefer natural fiber, uh, but I have, I have a real variety of, of sort of everything. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I've got, uh, those are sort of my go-to brushes, but then I'll use, I've got a lot of weird tools as well. Um, I use a plastic palette knife to kind of scrape with. Uh, this is also just a plastic, I think it's used for sculpting clay. Um, and I'll scrape with that if I want to do tree branches or, or, or things, um, you know, power lines or streetcar lines. Um, I'll use a very stiff kind of cheap bristle um, to sort of push pigment around on the page to give different textures. Uh, I'll use, I have a, I have some of these which are very, I, this again, this is a very stiff synthetic fiber um, that's really great for lifting out colors after everything's dry. If there's, if there's sort of highlights I want to create or, or areas that I want to lighten, you know, you can just use this with clean water, brush it and dab it with a paper towel and that can lift out some of the pigment. Um, so I, I sort of have, I mean, I, I do kind of go overboard with, with variety when it comes to brushes. Um, and I've just recently started buying, uh, Things like, things like this, which, you know, I'm not even sure what they're intended for. This is wood and this is kind of a silicon rubber. It just feels like you could scrape, um, you know, get some interesting lines and shapes, scraping pigment around. So, you know, 
I'll use my fingers. I, you know, it's sort of whatever I have handy. Um, I have very expensive brushes. I have very cheap brushes and it's just kind of whatever gets the job done. I feel like there's, uh, there's no rules when it comes to getting pigment on your paper. I have a toothbrush. I, I use a toothbrush quite a bit. So uh, you'll, you'll see me play tomorrow. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be back for, for my demo and you'll see some of this in action. Are, are we getting a, a, a building landscape painting from you tomorrow? We are, yes, yes. Oh yeah, I'll do, a, I'll do a Paris cafe. It's sort of, uh, that's my wheelhouse. Um, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll kind of play with a lot of these colors that we've talked about tonight. Um, I'll play with a lot of these brushes and I'll kind of talk through my whole process and, and hopefully, hopefully we'll have a good time. Have, have you been in, uh, you in the, sorry, go on. Was uh, it, can I? Go ahead. Sorry, go uh, sorry, thank you. Alex, hi, this is Angela. I wanted to say hello. <laughs> hello, sorry. how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Yes, I am in France at the moment, so it was a bit hectic. I'm in Rochemore, ah. so yeah, the hotel has very little internet. I have my don't have my paints here, but mm. anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, wanted to know if, <laughs> if you have uh, used the heron brushes at all. Do you the know heron? Which are they? Korean brushes. Heron. Uh, heron. I don't think so. No. No, they're, they're the Chin okay. Chinese or Japanese. No, 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 it's Korean. 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 Oh, no, -E I haven't. R E N D. Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't tried those. No, no. Basically, all those brushes like that are called hake or hake brushes. Oh, you mean the. Um, I do have. Yeah, but they also have. Angela, yeah. we got to ask Alex the question that you sent as a direct like, message after this. Yeah, that, that's it. That's, an, that, that's, a, that's for putting big washes over. Yeah, yeah, start. yeah. But the other Korean... No, no, but they have like a broom. They have a brush that is like a very, uh, like a very funny shape of broom that okay. you can make trees with. And it's, I think you would like mm -hmm. it. I, yeah, well, all right. I know what I'm doing tomorrow, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Today, in fact, we're getting our bonus in advance because um, mm. Alex, oh, when I started oh, sharing yeah. tips, and so generous of you, Alex, to to share um, tips and basically about your, your journey and process. Mm. Uh, yeah, before I forget, uh, actually, is it Barbara? Oh, yeah, it's Barbara who sent this question. Uh, this is for you, Alex, and for our guests here. So the question is, uh, what colors would you take to Egypt? <laughs> to Egypt? I, you know, I've never been to Egypt. So, uh, you know, I'd probably, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'd probably get my, my yellow ochre. I'd get that, um, you know, I don't know. I gotta oh, think about that. Um, Anyone oh, from here? You should take... You should take hematites. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Lapis I love that color. Yeah. Okay. That well, I it's have close, close to the equator, isn't it? So it's going to be fairly, uh, fairly bright. So I do. Bright, yeah. Um, yeah, but then you're you're playing with kind of all those sort of subtle uh sandy Shimmer. browns mm -hmm. but then you want to come in with some nice shadow colors well, um, yeah that they look pinkish too that's true depending on the time of day um that hematite genuine uh that's a gorgeous i love that pigment i'll i'll mix yeah. that with all kinds of things because i i love that granulation it's really gorgeous also um, hematite violet is one of my right, favorites it's one of my favorites yeah oh, the okay. violet yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Really I hematite burn scarlet. Hematite burn scarlet has amazing granulations, and it's mm. like reddish. You know. Mm. Yes. Alex uh, from Facebook said it's going to be yellow ochre and deep scarlet. Must be on this trip. Okay. Sounds okay. 
<laughs> I use buff titanium a lot for the sand. Buff titanium. Mm. That's Bell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank mm. you, everybody. Alex. Alex, tomorrow I don't want to disturb you while while you are going to be painting. We will enjoy your painting tomorrow. Yeah. But tonight I have a suggestion. <laughs> Probably I will be I will be by end of July in Paris with my family, and let's do some together plain air there for one day. Okay, sounds good. And what about that? Uh, and I'm I, in. I, I will I will bring you a few of the hair and brushes. I have good collection of those. Okay. And one of my favorites is also Neve brushes, uh, loose red ones. Have you tried the Neve brushes? I will also bring one of those. Okay. Right. Brushes. You know my weakness, so I, I can't say no to yeah, brushes. Yeah, I will do that. <laughs> I, I, I heard that, that you are crazy about brushes. So yeah, okay. Something. Yeah, send okay. me a message and... Uh, yeah. Okay, good, good. I will write you in Instagram, I think you are. Okay, there. good. Thank you. Amazing, Alex. you just planned something. <laughs> right? Yeah, we're just putting it together. I love it. But we must will, all travel Ethel. to Paris now. We must Ethel. all travel to Paris. When are yeah, you yeah. going? Yeah, you are all welcome, Angela. I will be by end of July, probably with family up to mid of uh, August. But this, I would like to go through Ethel and through DS, through DS group, so we can do some live, whatever uh, you guys think that it's a good idea. Okay, I like it. Sounds good. Alex, well, you mentioned. Nice. Oh, go ahead. I nice. mentioned um, that you're inspired by the Impressionists. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they used to gather together a lot in Paris to sit and chat and talk about art and all that sort of stuff. We know all that set of stories. Have you ever been to any of those places? Where they actually uh, went to any of the, any of the bars and restaurants that, that they mm -hmm. ate? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I'm also a Hemingway fan, so I, you know, I sort of like to imagine myself in his footsteps. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's sort of hard to walk around Paris and not, uh, you know, kind of bump into a famous cafe or a famous bar and so-and-so drank here once and uh, you know I, I, I definitely feel that history when I'm when I'm here um, so yeah and that's that's also a, a huge inspiration just to, to feel definitely like you're a to, definitely a place to meet up one day absolutely absolutely uh, yeah I would suggest the home of impressionism mm. Mark not the beginning of it though Ooh. That's nice, Mark. I like it. Yeah, you got um, you got burnt scarlet, which I'm glad you like. You like as well. I like it as well. It's a red that you know goes on to almost on organic organic side. So mm -hmm. that's a great one. And you got one of my favorite mixes, which is soda light and organic vermilion. Mm, very nice. They just mix so nicely, and uh, the rest is all the ones that some of them on your dot card. I love it. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah. I love it. And got some nice granulation going there as well, like I said. Mm. Yeah. A yellow cloud. And a beautiful abstract composition. There seems to yeah. be a horse there in the middle. <laughs> right? Horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Oh, also, no, some horse there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for sharing. Well, I think we're good for today. Um, thank you, everyone. Let me just put everyone in gallery view. There you go. Thank you, Alex, for being so generous with your time. It's a beautiful surprise to have you today, day before your actual demo. And we can't wait to have you again tomorrow. And of course, with John, um, to everyone who share their swatch, their palette. Thank you, Anna, uh, Mark, uh, Patrice, and who else? I think there are two others. And of course, Gio and Letty um, and Ian. So we'll all look forward to seeing you again mm -hmm. tomorrow. Don't forget it's 1030 at Seattle time. Bye guys. Okay, thank you everyone. See you bye tomorrow. Bye.